All right, recording. All right, welcome everyone. I hope you enjoyed the break, such as it was. Um, and so my, um, when I was um, thinking about the schedule, I was um, mixing up the end of the fall semester with the end of the fall session at the Evanston Art Center. And I, for some reason, assumed that next week is our last week of Harper classes. But next week is our last week of classes, but then we have exam week after. So the 16th is when you're going to have your final exam. Um, next Wednesday, the 9th, I'd like you to have that as your goal for finishing the last of the uh, vocabulary cards, the 13, um, to go with the 12 from earlier. Um, and that's, um, you know, if you have uh, questions about yours in particular, you can uh, take a picture and send it to me and ask me my opinion of it. Um, you can, you know, you can choose any um, anything from the from the class. You can draw some modern furniture. You can go back and draw some gothic and ancient stuff if that's if that's stuff that you're still interested in. Uh, we've had a lot. You've had a lot of uh, information about classical and what makes something classical. The final exam will focus on the 20th century and the, um, um, you know, there may be some uh, references to classical elements such as like in, in the uh, postmodern uh, design that occurred in the you know, 70s and the 80s. There are uh, classical um, classical, I guess, motifs are used or referred to. So you still need to know what those things are. Um, some of the kind of cartoony uh, postmodern furniture refers back to earlier styles of furniture, like um, you know Louis the Sixteenth. Um, Chippendale and that kind of thing. So um, you'll still need to know, you know, just you'll still need to remember what those things are or look them up. You know, the way the exams are um, set up, you have the opportunity to look up answers and hopefully it's not, uh, not too um, obscure for you to find the answers. Um, you know, I try to just keep it within the realm of um, what we're doing in the class, of course. So I wouldn't. Uh, oh. <clears throat> All right. Um, so the um, yeah um, yeah I might want to make a little short quiz as like a prep for the final, but we'll see. Um, if I do, it will only be to your benefit. Um, now tonight we want to talk about, um, like get from the uh, middle of the 20th century into the sixties and the seventies, uh, and the 1980s. So, um, do you remember, uh, what we talked about last time? We talked about Art Deco, we talked about uh, mid-century modern, um, and even, I believe, a few styles before that. Yes, we did. Um, I remember I was, I showed you some, um, um, we talked about mid-century modern, which is important because it leads into some of the, we'll talk about a little bit of um, Scandinavian modern. Um, and then get into some like 1960s and uh, 70s stuff. The um, one of the presentations was about some uh, interior designers who were really before there were <clears throat> excuse me 
before there were interior designers, there were interior decorators uh, like Siri Mom or Elsie DeWolf. And um, they were important for us giving, you know, starting the idea of, you know, the interiors, interiors as spaces that should be designed rather than just, you know, have, you know, buy furniture and put it in um, without really thinking of it as a composition or a design. And, uh, you know, it's because some of it was, some of it was done for um, resident, you know, private residences. Some of it was done as set design in Hollywood in the 1930s. Um, you know, it was, um, especially the work that was done in set design, it has to be very intentional for its visual impact. And that's something that's important about interior design that, you know, it's, you could, you know, you can live in a place without, without interior design, but you know, the interior design makes it meaningful or just, uh, you know, there's something nice about having, having composed the place you live in. Um, Florence Knoll, um, she was a very important person. The, um, the Knoll planning unit that was a part of Knoll International and the, Knoll is the, the furniture company that manufactured a lot of the mid-century modern stuff. They still do. Uh, if you look at their website, you can still buy those classics that they design that were designed in the forties, fifties and sixties. Mostly what Knoll makes now is office systems. That's really where they make their money. And then they have, they, you know, they still have their, um, their stuff, you know, their, their classic mid-century stuff. Originally their mid-century stuff was office furniture, but, uh, now everybody wants, um, cubicles and, you know, ergonomic, uh, chairs that do all kinds of things. Um, honestly for myself, none of it really looks all that good. Um, but it is functional and so sort of its function is its primary, uh, really seems to be its primary, uh, the primary concern of the designers. Um, and the null planning unit was really, so what, you know, when you have, um, steel frame construction in modern buildings, what that means is that the structure, there's a skeleton structure and the interior walls are not load bearing. And so, um, for the most part, you can just move those interior walls wherever you want them to go. And there are, sometimes there's, a, um, you know, uh, there's like, uh, uh, water lines, like a water, like risers and drainage for, uh, water systems, or, you know, you've got to have some place for, um, conduit, like metal conduit that carries the wiring for your electrical system. But, you know, for the most part, you can just, you know, you can knock walls down and move them. That doesn't require an architect to come back. Uh, what really happened is that steel frame construction in tall buildings um, really helped to bring about the discipline, like the sort of like sub-discipline within interior, within architecture of interior design. So, you know, the interior designer is a specialist within architecture and you need to know, you know, you learn how to make CAD drawings, you know, you know so you learn how to make construction drawings. You learn about electrical systems. You learn about codes so that, um, you know, you can make drawings that recompose an interior, um, you don't, you know, you have to have those checked by, you know, an, an architect to make sure that you haven't missed something or to, you know, specified something that won't work, uh, that might be outside your, um, you know, your professional, uh, I guess the, the parameters of, your, of the profession of interior design, something you just don't know. Um, 
but for the most, you know, but you know, interior designers have to learn more about the process of architecture than you know the earlier uh, some of the the earlier um, decorators like Elsie De Wolf, uh, where you know they were not necessarily overseeing construction, but you know um, as you know. Well, uh, I guess sort of based on the conversation that we had last week with uh, Christy Yarbrough, there's um, a very, you know, the interior designer now has to have a, you know, you have uh, an interaction with the construction. So it's not just moving for, you know, it's not just changing surfaces, which is, you know, there's, Honestly, there's there's nothing wrong with being a decorator. A, a good decorator, really, to me, would be like a more like a sculptor. And you know, you, you know, you compose uh, in you know within three dimensions with furnishings, with um, you know wall coverings, surfaces, paint, um, and you make something that is um, presumably beautiful. So those, um, you know, the predecessors of interior designers um, from the early 20th century um, are they're, they're important, and um, you know, then you have the uh, professional, like the profession of interior designer that was really um, largely created by Florence Knoll and the Knoll, and the Knoll Planning Unit. Um, I don't think that her influence can be underestimated. Uh, she did a lot to, you know, she created a lot with the, with the Knoll Planning Unit. So much that other architecture firms copied, copied the Knoll Planning Unit and the architecture, architecture firms started to hire uh, teams of interior designers when they have, when they had large buildings, such as, you know, when you like um, Hancock, the Hancock Building or the Sears Tower, uh, both in Chicago, uh, designed uh, by Skidmore, Owings, and, and Merrill. Those are a lot. That's a lot of square footage, and it's not one client top to bottom. And so you have multiple clients taking up, you know, one floor, five floors, ten floors, and you've got, um, you know, you've got. A lot of you know, there's a, there are a lot of floors in those buildings, so uh, it made sense that they would hire interior designers who would be specialists in addressing the needs of the clients for you know the details of their furnishings, uh, surfaces, um, brand identity, even you know the whole um, you know uh, branded branded interiors. Um, for commercial, you know, for commercial clients, that's, um, I think that's actually pretty important. So that's, you know, and that's, you know, that's commercial stuff. Um, you know, maybe if, if you know, um, it's residential is, is different, but, uh, you know, I really think, I mean, all of it is, is, you know, basically the same, um, the same practice of, you know, composing an interior. Okay, so um, I'm going to read a little bit. Let me um, bring up share screen and go big. Okay, so um, yeah, modern to postmodern. Ba -da -ba -ba. Alvar Alto, a Finnish designer, and uh, this from uh, page starting page three hundred and thirty-four in the Abrams Guide on the. Uh, Scandinavian 
which is approximately 1950 to 1970. Uh, so as the author writes, in the years just, bef just after World War II, when the steel and glass design vocabulary of international style was making its mark, an alternative humanistic approach to modernism was emanating from the group of countries just north of the European continent, Scandinavia, um, and included, you know, um, so Finland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, um, you know, Iceland, not, uh, the, I, I, I can't identify any Icelandic uh, mid-century like, you know, designers offhand, but, um, you know, they're kind of always been attached to Denmark. Anyway, so until the early 20th century, Scandinavian styles reflected those of its European neighbors. But as the last of these countries achieved independence, Norway in 1905, Finland in 1918, Iceland in 1944, they developed individual approaches to design, but with shared ideals and a common aesthetic. And aesthetic refers to what is beautiful or appealing. Beginning as early as the 1930s, Alvar Aalto in Finland and Bruno Matsen in Sweden and others like Hans Wegner and Finn Juhl in Denmark were basing their designs for interiors and furniture on a love of natural materials, a respect for handicraft, and a long tradition of cabinet making skills. So wood is a dominant material in Scandinavian. In other countries, good design was considered to be a democratic right rather than an elitist privilege. Following the much quoted manifesto of Swedish critic Gregor Paulsson, more beautiful things for everyday use. They pursued the goal of socially responsible design, focusing on human needs as much as and often more than aesthetics. The resulting objects and the interiors that surrounded them offer a less, offered a less radical but more accessible and more accessible option for those put off by severe European-born modernism. Through exhibitions and international fairs, including those in Paris 1925, New York in 1939, and the triennial events in, in Milan in the 1950s, Scandinavian, des Scandinavian design, first Swedish glass, then Swedish modern, and later Danish modern furnishings, became an international success and built an important export industry for the countries that developed it. Scaled to the modest proportion of most, most Nordic homes, Scandinavian furniture was well suited to the apartments and suburban, suburban ranch homes of post-World War II America, which became one of its most enthusiastic markets. Okay. So wood is important. Um, plywood is important. Um, you know, in uh, the, this is like, you know, something that, um, something else that we're all very familiar with that comes out of this is Ikea. Um, you know, Ikea became, you know, that really started um, back in, oh gosh, at least the 60s, probably earlier. And, you know, they, they were more like this, um, like low cost, packed flat, you know, things were meant to be, um, you know, they would ship flat and be cut and scored and have holes drilled and come with all the hardware just as they are now. And the, um, you know, this idea that it was like, um, similar to like prefabrication in, a uh, certain like you know certain architecture like Frank Lloyd Wright had his prefab designs this is like you know prefabricated furniture that you would buy it take it home and assemble it okay 
Let's see. So all of our alto. So here's the, uh, he designed the finished pavilion at the World's Fair in New York, 1938-1939. Pretty spectacular. Here is a very interesting and organic base. Simple and beautiful. So this is a design in Scandinavia in 1954. So this was well, you know, the Scandinavian design was, was uh, well known and desired in this country going back decades. Here is one of his most famous chairs, the uh, Pimeo chair. I'm not sure if that's the correct pronunciation. Molded and bent birch plywood. Birch plywood, that's a signature material of Alvar Alto and a lot of the um, Scandinavian design. Uh, you know, this is like some of the Scandinavian design. So there's an image of uh, the bent plywood being bent. It's made in veneers. I believe we looked at this. This is part of an earlier uh, presentation. So it's, it's still, you know, it's, it's, um, manufacturing is involved. Um, you know, uh, industrial, industrial processes are, you know, now just a foregone conclusion in furniture construction. You know, there's so much furniture is needed that it really can't be, you know, the like, um, you know, will the the idea of William Morris, you know, William Morris's desire to have uh, furniture returned to a more, you know, handcrafted state, it's really just impossible. It's impossible in the 20th century if you want to make anything that anybody can afford. You can still, you know, people still make hand, you know, do you know, handmade furniture. Um, I took a series of courses in furniture, you know, in the, uh, woodworking with the goal of furniture design. And, uh, I made a, I made a few tables, which were fun to make. Um, and the amount of time, you know, you learn how to do this, but even, you know, making it at a, uh, you know, me making a table, even if I get fast at it is slow. Here is a simple birch stool. Designed to be stacked neatly and create a pretty cool pattern. But it's um like you know it's really simple and beautiful. And you know it's um you know, we looked back in the 19th century, there is the Tone furniture. And Tone furniture has this like, you know, bent, laminated bent wood, uh, relatively simple. So really, you know, Oliver Alto is doing stuff similar to what Tone did, um, maybe about 75 years after the fact. All right, Aero Saarinen. Uh, he, uh, his father, Eliel Saarinen, was a well-known modernist architect, and um, Saarinen designed furniture for Knoll. He, um, he and Florence Knoll had known each other when they were young, um, and so when she took over Knoll, um, Aero Sarnin was one of the designers she recruited to design furniture for Knoll. So here is the pedestal. He's like the author of the famous pedestal furniture. He had this aversion to seeing like a 
you know, like a restaurant or, you know, some place where there are a lot of chairs and tables and just seeing there's so many legs coming down to the floor that he, re he thought of it as this forest of legs. So he designed the pedestal table to really, the pedestal furniture to really try to clean that up. Here is um, a little bit of his um, architecture. Uh, he designed the TWA terminal in New York, 19, you know, uh, built der, uh, over the course of six years, and um, looks a little bit like Gaudi to me. Um, it's you know meant to look sculptural. Uh, the curves are not perfect. It's really, you know, it's, um, um, but very organic, wouldn't you say? Yes, for sure. <clears throat> I really like seeing like, you know, public spaces like this that are really, it's for everybody. And like, you know, that information stand i mean it looks like you should be able to go up into the top of it <clears throat> and you know i don't know make an, make announcements or uh sing or something but i love i just love this like weird sculptural quality to it i uh, hear some sketches for the tulip chair uh saranen by the way uh is the guy who designed the st louis arch So he was um, that that big gateway art sculpture in uh, in St. Louis. That's the Saranen design. So here I like the sketches, and there you have some of his um, pedestal this uh, pedestal furniture. In the uh, pendant light hanging just low enough so that you can't see the person across from you. Make that a little higher. But I believe this is in a showroom. Uh, this uh, Columbus, Indiana. Columbus, Indiana is a um, place where there is a, a remarkable amount of good architecture. Um, I don't recall offhand. I, I know I've, I know that I've, I've learned this, but I can never really remember why. Um, you know, what attracted all of this modern architecture to Columbia, Indiana, to Columbus, Indiana. But here is a Saarinen, uh, the Miller House, uh, with this conversation pit or this sunken, sunken area in the living room. This is something that becomes a feature in the 1970s. It's a little bit more known for being part of this like 70s design, but you know, here's Saarinen way ahead of his time. Uh, this like, that is some serious built-in furniture. Uh, you can't do much, you know, if you're doing a renovation of this place, uh, you could make that a little like waiting pool or you have to keep, you've got to keep the little sunken conversation pit. All right, so uh, more uh, Scandinavian side. So, you know, so El, uh, Eero Saarinen is, you know, he's kind of claimed by both the United States and uh, Finland. I mean, the, the name is, is like, you know, uh, with the double the double vowels it's so finnish but um you know he really was uh, he was really more of american designer but you know he can be taught he can be tossed in with the with the scandinavians now here uh arne jacobson danish designer so it's some of these like the like the uh egg chair swan chair and the tongue or the drop chairs those are um, 
there, you know, this, these are chairs that are, that are used now to look modern when they were designed 1958. So that's, uh, you know, 60 years ago. Now here, I show you this, this is a, um, this is in London, um, the building by Norman Foster, a decorated English architect. And uh, this is uh, affectionately known as the gherkin or the pickle because of its appearance. But here in this interior, um, lounge area with contemporary versions of Le Corbusier's Le Grand Confort chairs. And there you go, some Jacob, Jacobson swan chairs. So this like this building, very modern building, you know, well, it's, at this point, it's, you know, oh, a little bit less than 20 years old. But still, you see this midst, like, you know, modernist, like international style with uh, Corbusier. And then you have the Jacobson mid-century modern swan chairs. Um, still considered to be, you know, sort of like an, it's, it's like it's, they're an example of modern even though they've, uh, you know, at this point, they are a style from the past. But I think that the, you know, modernism, like a lot of the modern stuff, mid-century modern, the international style modernism, it was well-designed and so successful that we still think of it as modern, as in contemporary, which means right now. Still works as contemporary furniture. Here, the ant chair, I love this. I mean, that's like a, just a flat shape of wood that is formed to create the seat and the back. Hans Wegner, the chair. Uh, simple, beautiful. So this is the kind of stuff that, um, you know, like Hans Wegner's furniture is not cheap, and you know it's it's made it's made well, um, but you know you can see like with the simple joinery with the two different types of wood for the arm and the back. And here is uh, Finn Yule, the chieftain. Some very nice curves with this um, looks kind of like teak or something with that wood. And then the leather is, you know, really like both with this, these chairs, the, you know, the, that like that leather upholstered seat and arm is meant to go with the color of the wood. And um, it's a nice design feature. Uh, here again, some of the uh, this is a I guess this is a little bit mis uh, out of out of order. But the um, Sarandon furniture in his Miller house in Columbus, Indiana. Big open plan house. That, you know, but yeah, you know, uh, something that you can, if you look at that chandelier, um, that looks, it's a little hard to see, but it looks a little traditional. Um, you know, your client might get a, you know, might, might just have some, some, you know, something like that, that they really want and it may or may not go with the rest of the modern, modern stuff, but, uh, Sometimes it's just what you got to do. All right. So we, I know we talked about Levittown uh, with the prefab, all the prefab stuff uh, two weeks ago. Um, you know, not a bad, not a bad idea to uh, review this here in this, in this uh, presentation. Um, you know, this was, um, 
you know, the uh, the idea of prefabricated stuff took off after World War II because it was needed. And so um, a lot of people accepted metal furniture like this. And, you know, of course, also these new appliances like refrigerators, dishwashers, uh, clothing washers, all this stuff was, you know, like um, it was new furniture. And so um, it was, uh, I think it was probably easier to accept it because they were new and also that they needed homes, they needed furniture. And so it was uh, a little easier to, it kind of broke down the resistance to modern design and modern materials. So here, this is a sort of modernish. You know, it's almost like this is a, uh, you know, this is English, Herod's is. So, um, a little, you know, it's like this chair, the, the upholstered chair and sofa are uh, a little bland. That, um, that, that two level table, um, I remember, you know, that, like, that's sort of like, you know, when I was, uh, in college, you know, when you went to the thrift store to find furniture that's cheap, you would find a lot of stuff. These, these sort of like a uh, side table that had like a smaller top uh, surface of a like table surface and then a longer lower surface. TVs. TVs are new objects, new designs. Um, oh, Eames. I know we did go through. Eames, this is their case study house where they were trying things out. Uh, this um, is some of their furniture. So Charles and Ray and Charles Eames designed for Herman Miller. So this is some of their furniture for Herman Miller, which was also, you know, um, like Knoll, they designed a lot of stuff that was sort of like both residential and commercial, like this is for offices or could be for offices or it could be for your home. There they are, Ray on the left, Charles on the right. I like their quirky house, it's, it's weird. But there in the, fore, in the, uh, the lounge chair with the ottoman, does anyone recognize that Eames lounge chair? Yes. Oh. It's very popular, uh, even up until this day. Is it is it uh, by Herman Miller or is it by Kay, uh, by Null? It's uh it's uh, Herman Miller. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, so you can yeah you yeah. can still buy the Eames is designed for Herman Miller. Yeah, and it's and it 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 looks very um, very nice too. I just wanted to also share. About how you mentioned that, you know, you go to Goodwill to buy stuff for college. Yes. Um, this past summer, um, I was looking for like a cheap um, office chair. And I went uh, to Goodwill here in Palatine, actually. Mm -hmm. And I found this chair that um, it, it's like this mid-century modern. Um, it has this, it had this like green vinyl mm -hmm. um upholstery but um it was all made with it was very heavy very sturdy it was made here in illinois in aurora by some steel company that i think they exist still today they make office, office furniture mm -hmm. um and it it reclines and everything which from i found this on um like resale sites later for like almost um like 200 dollars or something like that 175 i bought it for like seven bucks yeah. i I painted the thing, but it, it's such a nice chair. Cool. That, you know, that's the kind of thing that will make you go back to the thrift store. Look, I know. I love thrift stores. For more things. There, you know, that's, it is. But, you know, that's, you know, there's probably, you know, that steel, that company out there, like that company in Aurora, you know, like if it, it was probably doing the same thing that, you know, it's sort of like a local version of Noel and Herman Miller uh, saying, like, we'll design our own chairs. 
Yeah, probably. I think I've looked them up. Um, I think they're named differently now, but they still make um, like office furniture. Yeah. Yeah. The chair, I, I thought it was an incredible find. That's cool. Yeah, I, you know, I will, I've been known to go, I mean, I still will go and look just to see, you know, if, even if I don't need anything, I'm interested to see what, what's there. Um, <clears throat> I have a friend in Iowa who's, um, we were in graduate school together and he has, he goes ever since he was, you know, an undergraduate, he would go to estate sales, auctions, flea markets, and he knew, he had learned about furniture, and so he knew what to look for, and he would find, like, people selling, you know, really nice furniture at auction, and, you know, he would get it for... Like, without knowing what it's worth, right? Yeah, and there were times when he would, or he would, you know, bid on something thinking, I think that's you know, a nice piece of furniture and then he would get it and then he would look at it and go like, nah, this is a knockoff. But, you know, he would look sometimes, I mean, cause you know, sometimes he couldn't quite tell. Um, but it was really, uh, but it was really interesting to see cause I would go to his apartment and he would have like three sofas in his living room and he'd say, I had to buy them. <laughs> he said, these are really, he said, I can, I can sell these for a lot of money, but I've just, you know, but I, I just, I had to have them, you know, and he would sell them. But at some point, like you would go to his apartment and you couldn't go any, you couldn't go like, it was just full of stuff because he hadn't sold it yet. Well, so that's the Eames, that is the Eames lounge chair and it is still available through Herman Miller. Uh, they are expensive now, um, but it's really, it's like, you know, just like, the Barcelona chair, um, the hot, the, like the um, Marcel Breuer Seska chair, um, a lot of like, you know, the Saarinen furniture, George Nelson. This stuff is, um, you know, it's, it's just really, it was, it's just really successful and, you know, it's uh, sort of like acknowledged as being good design. Molded plastic, uh, fiberglass, the uh, like thin steel, uh, like that thin steel frame. Um, you know, these are all in like, you know, uh, foam, foam rubber, like that's, you know, like the foam, upol like the uh, upholstery over foam. It has like, that's like a plastic frame with uh, foam on it. And, you know, so that is like, those are the new materials and these are industrial materials. And then we looked at these guys. Um, so I wanted to see these again, just because it's a lead up to some of the stuff that comes later. So the, uh, coconut chairs by, uh, George Nelson for Herman Miller. The, some of this stuff is just getting kind of, it gets kind of fun and just kind of silly, uh, playful. And really kind of like, you know, leads the way for, leads the way into stuff like this, which is, uh, you know, from the 1960s. This is like, um, you know, this is, I guess you could consider this to be like pop, pop art. Like sort of like, you know, something um, that would go along with um, the, uh, you know, Andy Warhol's uh, screen prints of, Campbell soup cans. So it's uh, PVC plastic inflated. Um, and, you know, this is like, um, you know, this is a chair. It functions as a chair. It's, you know, as long as it doesn't lose its air, it'll hold you. Um, but it's also, it's, it's playful. It's kind of silly. It's very informal. It's inexpensive. You know, you could manufacture these and sell them at, for pretty low low cost, uh, or at a low at a low price compared to other furniture. Uh, you know, it's kind of similar to the bean bag. Uh, now here, this is um, 
these are some other like Italian. So the Italians and like this Italian design is really like, you know, poppy and fun and, you know, you could say irreverent. This is a uh, Joe Sofa as in Joe DiMaggio, the baseball player. Uh, this is a um, sofa based on his baseball glove. He made another, um, they made another one, uh, Marilyn Sofa, which is like Marilyn Monroe's lips. Has anyone seen that? I, 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 recall so. I think I've seen pictures yeah. of it. Yeah. So you have seen it, a couple of you. Yes, I think yeah. it looks uh, lacquered, almost it's like, like big hard plastic. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't have one here. I'll like find, we'll like look one up. Um, there was an earlier lips sofa uh, that was based on Mae West, the uh, older, like you know, earlier uh, film actor. And uh, then there was a, uh, I think um, Salvador Dali designed that. And then uh, these uh, Italians designed the lips sofa based on Marilyn Monroe. It was at a time when Joe DiMaggio and Marilyn Monroe had dated, so uh, they were kind of pair. They were kind of like you know a pair. Here, plastic, 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 um, mass-produced. Uh, these stacking chairs are meant to stack on top of each other. Um, this is, um, yeah, this is a. Uh, you know, I guess this is the, you know, this is a, uh, it's functional. Uh, there is design to it. I mean, I kind of like the red plastic. Um, it's um, not the most durable or um, comfortable chair you will sit in. But it really, like, this is a, it's emblematic of the, I mean, really, like, the process the industrial process is um, kind of a big part of how this furniture is, um, like where this furniture comes from. Be hard to, you couldn't really design that and like make this by hand. Would um, acrylic furniture be Scandinavian as well? Um, not, uh, like, I think when you think of, like, the mid-century, like, Scandinavian modern, um, I would not, mm -hmm. uh, I would, I would, um, you know, are you thinking of any specific pieces? Um, I mean, I've seen a lot of, like, acrylic desks and acrylic uh, chairs. They're just, like, clear. Yeah plastic looking furniture. So there's this with the pattern of plastic and some, you know, clear furniture. I didn't know if that would be considered Scandinavian. Um, I wouldn't consider it Scandinavian. There's, um, there's a, what would you consider it? Like what style of furniture? It's more postmodern. Um, I think the, uh, okay. No, there's a, so I'll show, I'll bring up the guys, like the, I'll, I'll look this up um, and show that, show you some, some of it. Uh, there's a, a French designer, Philippe Stark, and he designed um, this, um, it is a Louis the 16th chair, but it's done in acrylic and it's called Louis Ghost. And, um, you know, it's really something that, I mean, I, I, I like it because it's kind of funny. Um, let me see. Uh, I'll, I'll look, I'll, I'll get that once we get through this here. So, um, I just found it. It looks cool. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's really, it's a nice idea. Like the postmodern stuff gets to be really campy and fun and, you know, doing things that the modernists had always told, had, you know, been saying, you can't do this. Like no fun, no curve, like, like no, like, you know, no reference to the past. Um, you know, the, I think the best postmodern stuff um refers to previous like you know earlier styles but executes it in such a way that there's no way you could confuse it with the original all right um this is like, you know, these like industrial furniture pods, total furnishing unit. Um, really, like if you think about the plastic chairs, it's like, this is like a, like, you know, um, entire room done this, done with basically the same way. It looks like it belongs in an RV or something, or, yes. you know looks like a one solid unit yeah yeah it's a it's a dedicated unit that could be like prefabbed and put into look it does look like it's more like something you'd see on a train or um in a uh i guess maybe like a really small apartment um but it's really more like uh yeah I mean, it's interesting this is the kind of thing where um you know, the more, the longer people do design, uh, the more opportunity there is to try to solve problems that have been around for a long time. And, you know, how to maximize space, especially if you have to have, you know, like if you've got, um, like a, really you just have, you have a limited amount of, um, space whether it's in like an apartment building in a city or if it's on like a you know um a, like a plane i mean like the bathrooms on airplanes are a joke um so i don't know um but you know there was a certain like more like luxury air travel in those days too um so i don't know like i can imagine this is like on the the concord jet Um, this, so like, um, yeah, this, like, I like, so here, like, this is, uh, like sixties. So this is like, you know, I think I would say this is pop. This is pop culture in interior design. Um, this sort of trippy, you know, uh, wall graphic painting and this, uh, strange like the furniture you know it's it's you know it's meant to be cool a little strange like the oversized the oversized uh poles for the for those cabinet doors and um the the chair with just those you know the big flat side for its arm uh not something that you would really set rest your arm on but uh you know it's it's meant to be interesting possible probably more than it's meant to be functional you know it's like it's a lot of like modern furniture you've got to use it the way the designer intended rather than you know it conforming to what you would do Mm -hmm. So now there, um, Hope, you mentioned, you asked about um, acrylic tables. Uh, the uh, Those pastel chairs are by a Finnish designer. And that's, you know, those are just like these big okay. fiberglass chairs. So, uh, so I guess it would have, I think that um, I would consider those to be more like pop or postmodern. 
and not so much mm -hmm. Scandinavian modern. Okay, that makes sense. And so here, this is a uh, Stanley Tigerman was a, a postmodern architect uh, based here in Chicago. That is a photo collage, and that is Crown Hall at IIT sinking. This is his, you know, of course, this is after the death of Mies van der Rohe, um, but he's, uh, you know, officially and symbolically uh, declaring the death of modernism. You know, there was a lot of, you know, modernism had, you know, imposed a lot of rules. And really, I think by the 1960s, a lot of young architecture students just had, were really just kind of fed up with, you know, all the things that they were told you're not allowed to do. You know, no classical references, no arches, you know, no domes, nothing. No, you know, just, and at some point, one of them, like, um, I think it might have been Robert Venturi who asked, what's the matter with an arch? So um, this, so like, this is like some uh, almost like, you know, comically like toy furniture. Uh, but these are meant to be, um, you know, sort of like postmodern um versions of these different classic styles of chair, Sheraton, Chippendale, Biedermeier, Gothic Revival, Art Nouveau. And, um, you know, it looks like it's the, it's, it is the same, um, like bent, bent wood, um, process as the Saarinen furniture. Um, but there's just much simpler. So this is this is something that you would you know, like if other like neoclassical furniture or like you know a lot of neoclassical interiors they were using a lot of um, motifs almost like they were using really they like they were copying in a lot of respects and this stuff is not a, really an attempt to copy it's meant to remind you of it. Here at Charles Moore, um, now if you look at this, you can see classical elements in it, but it is not, you know, you can see that it's modern. Now you can see there are these um, uh, Corinthian capitals on the uh, upper part of the of the building but then those like um those like metal columns uh they look more like rooks in chess you know, on a chess board than uh any other col any, any type of column i've ever seen and you know i remember so you know i was around when this kind of stuff was being built i was you know i was young i started college in the uh, in the early 1980s. And you know, I remember seeing some of this stuff and it was kind of weird. Um, but it was also kind of cool. Uh, the Memphis group was a postmodern, uh, really it's sort of like a, um, you know, it's not one person. It's, uh, you know, designed by different people. Uh, this Memphis, like that stuff is, you know, um, I'm not, you know, I'm not one, usually one to say something, is ugly, but that's kind of ugly. Uh, neon was, was really hot in the 70s. You can see that little neon ring around the uh, upper part of that column. But uh, it looks like a uh, video gamer's room. Yeah, it kind of does. I Man, it looks like all the stuff, especially I, with the chairs. That looks like a 
sorry. Go ahead. Hey, no, go ahead. No, I was going to say that my brother, when he was younger, he had a, a video gaming chair that looked just like that. Yeah. All right. The same shape and everything. Well, it kind of looks like it was like computer, like like generated by computers in the '80s, which would be not very, you know, wouldn't be mm -hmm. very sophisticated. Um, it's weird. Like, it looks very '80s. Yes, everything looks like it's made of foam rubber. Mm -hmm. You know, like the furniture, the tail, like the weird little discs on um, on the table, and you know, like this, like geometry. It does. You know, it's kind of, I remember seeing like this kind of like nonsense application of geometry in the 70s. Um, you and this um, Atari Satsas Carlton room divider for Memphis in 1981. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, like this, like simple geometry, very, you know, very colorful, um, kind of, you know, well, a lot of really punchy colors. And then this like weird, like, you know, like texturized base that I can, I still remember it. And I, I really have to say, I dislike that. Um, but it's, this is an interesting piece of furniture. But very like simple and kind of clunky, you know. Clunkiness was like they really were not that interested in trying to make anything too graceful. So Michael Graves, another, uh, you know, Michael Graves also did a lot of like industrial design. I have a mop that he designed for Target. Laura Ashley. So uh, this happened also in the 80s, this uh, nostalgia for, um, you know, old, like, you know, French and English um, sort of um, luxury. Um, so uh, chintz is uh, printed uh, floral fabric, like a cotton fabric printed with a floral design. Um, and it is, um, treated to be glossy. So it has this kind of like this, like this sheen to it. Um, and I actually, I can remember like Laura Ashley, there were lines of dresses with like this, the, the pattern that's on the on the furniture, like on the sofa and, and the armchair. Uh, this um, this is a an example of some really like you know minimalism, uh, first produced in the eighties. But this is also kind of like you know getting to this sort of logical conclusion of furniture that is like is it furniture or is it sculpture um made of steel uh looks cool it'd be kind of fun to sit in it for a little bit but i don't imagine it would be tremendously comfortable um yeah i was gonna say it's, it looks more like a sculpture than a enough. chair just because um, like you mentioned, it's not, it would not be particularly comfortable for your back or your no. bottom. No. Bring, bring your own cushions. Uh, you can imagine if this were sitting out, like, you know, like this were some, because it's made of stainless steel, you might put it outdoors and it might get really hot in the sun. I remember sitting, like, as a kid, sitting on, like, you know, some, like, like metal bench or something like that in, in the summer and like, oh man, it was like way too hot. So, you know, the eighties saw a lot of like, there was this nostalgia for, you know, this sort of like, you know, traditional 
luxury, there was this, you know, this is like a lot of like, you know, there's a, there was nostalgia for Art Deco in the 80s. Definitely. I remember Deco stuff. All right, and that is actually, I think that's the last one. Um, there we go. Okay, um, we'll stop. I'll take a break now.